Hey everyone, this is Pastor David Freeman from Jubilee Christian Center. We're excited to have you join us today, and we pray that today's message would encourage and enlighten your heart as you pursue your faith with God. Today we conclude our series, Gather, where we talk about the realization that God has called us together for the sake of encouraging one another so that we can go out and bring others to Him, transforming hearts and lives in the name of Jesus. on Gather. Today is the last Sunday that we'll be talking on this particular series. It will probably not be the last time that we talk about church because the church is not a building. The church is... That's right. The church is you. Not just people. The church is you. Say, I am the church. I am the church. That's right. Every single one of us is part of the church. And, and so... Uh, we will, anytime we talk about you, we're talking about the church. Anytime we look in the, the word of God about you, concerning you, we're talking about the church. But today is going to be our last gather um, uh, sermon, so to speak, on this series. And so uh, just a refresher, we've talked about church and what church is because, you know, so oftentimes we've defined church as a building or we've defined church as being uh, somewhere we go or, or we've had misconceptions about what church is supposed to look like. And, uh, you know, we know that through the scripture and through the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit came, that was the beginning of the church. And the church, when the Holy Spirit came, they began to serve, to pray. They were in the word and they were giving. They were generous. And those were the four things. That was the DNA of the church when the Holy Spirit fell. And that was the very beginning. And so today I want to conclude this series and uh, just talk a little bit. And I want to start off with this scripture in Matthew chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, then um, just listen here. Um, In Matthew chapter 16, it says in verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? In other words, he was saying, Who do people think that I am? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but the Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So basically what we've got here is we've got Jesus is with the disciples. And they've been going around, and Jesus has been doing some amazing things. And some people aren't exactly sure. In fact, some people still aren't even sure, even with all the great things that Jesus has done, they're not even sure if Jesus is still the one that was prophesied to be the Savior, the one that was supposed to come. So Jesus is with his disciples, and he asks them this question. You know, and I I personally, I don't like those questions that put you on the spot, you know. It's kind of like, here's a question, and I hope I, is this a trick question? You know, you want to answer it right? You don't want to get it wrong. And I mean, this is, this is Jesus, right? And he's, you want to look smart to Jesus, right? Wouldn't you want to look smart to Jesus? I mean, he's like the guy, right? And so anyways, Peter has the boldness to stand up and he says, I know who you are. You're the Messiah. You're the Christ. And Jesus says, Peter, you know what? That's the right answer. And you know what, Peter? I am going to build my church on that understanding. Now, a lot of people think that that means that God built the church on Peter, but that's not what God was saying there. God was saying, Peter, the fact that you understand that I am the Christ, that particular point, that understanding that you have, that's what the church is going to be built on. Now, what does that mean? What does, what does Jesus mean when he says, I'm going to build the church on this, on this idea that I am the Christ? What he was saying is, What does it mean to be the Christ? Christ, if you look at that word Christ, the actual definition of that word Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. God was saying to Peter that my church, in other words, not my building, but the people 
that follow me, the people that believe in me, the church, it's going to be built up on this idea and this understanding that Jesus Christ is the anointed one, that he's the savior, that he's the Messiah. And that word anointed one, it's so important that we understand what that means. And I understand that right now we're doing a little bit of teaching here, but the fact is, is that when we understand the anointing is the very thing that breaks the yoke, it breaks the heaviness, it breaks the burdens in people's lives, then we begin to understand what Jesus was saying. The fact that the anointing and the power of the anointing is actually what sets us free and transforms our lives, and that our lives cannot be changed outside of the power of Jesus Christ. And the fact that the church cannot be built on programs, the church can't succeed the way that God has intended for it to succeed. We can't do what God's called us to do outside of this understanding that everything is about Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ comes and he's the one that breaks people's bondage, that he's the one that sets them free from the hurt, the pain, and the suffering that they've experienced. And Jesus was saying, my church is going to build, be built on this idea We cannot do church without Jesus Christ. We cannot do church without the anointing. That anointing is also the presence of God in our lives. We cannot fully function. We cannot fully do everything that God's called us to do without the presence of God in our lives. Jesus said, there's nothing else that I'm building my church on. I'm not going to build it on. I'm not going to. I'm not going to build it on a particular man or a celebrity. I'm not going to build it on some guy's doctrine. I'm going to build it on this one fact. I'm going to build it on the fact that Jesus Christ is who He says He is. That He came, He died, but He lives again, and a relationship with Him is a relationship with the very things that we need in our life to set us free from depression, from anxiety, from the lies that we've believed about ourselves. This is what the church is for. When you look at yourself in the mirror and you say, I am the church, what you are essentially saying is that I carry the presence of God and that God is building his kingdom or God is doing his thing through my life to bring other people to a place of freedom in their lives. How often do we see ourselves as the catalyst, as the one that initiates freedom in people's lives? This is what the church is for. We're not here to give a message to make people feel good about themselves. We're here to bring people to Jesus Christ. If we do not bring people or point people to Jesus Christ, then we are not doing what the church is supposed to be built on. Because it is Jesus and Jesus alone that can change people's lives. This is why a relationship with him is so powerful. Because when we let him change us, when we have that relationship with Jesus, and we get to know him through the word and through prayer, and through hanging out with other people and hearing their experience of Jesus, as we do that, then we begin to look more and more like who he is. It doesn't mean that your personality completely changes. It doesn't mean that you all become like zombies of some sort that walk around looking exactly like little Jesuses. What it means is Jesus is in you and he makes the best of who he's created you to be and the world sees the very essence of what it means to have a savior in human form. Emmanuel, God with us. And this is what the church is about. You know, it's not enough just to believe that Jesus existed. There's a lot of religions that are okay with Jesus being, hey, you know what? You can talk to some people and say, yeah, I believe that Jesus was a real man. In fact, if you look outside of the Bible and you look at the writings of Josephus and other Roman writers, people in that time, contemporaries, that are outside of the Bible, they'll talk about Jesus. You can actually find writings about Jesus that are outside the Bible. You can find even in, in the Quran, he's mentioned but it's not enough just to believe that Jesus existed. We have to believe that he is the anointed one. We have to believe that him in relationship with us 
can make a difference in transforming people's lives. That those things that hold us back, that only Jesus can set us free from those things. And this is what the church is there to do. In Acts 5.42, it says, And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. If you read the book of Acts, and I highly recommend that you read the book of Acts, because you will see the power of God. You'll see a real relationship being demonstrated through the lives of people in the book of Acts. And that is still for today. Even Jesus said, for those who believe and will continue to believe, that includes us. If you believe in Jesus, then everything that happened in the book of Acts is available to the church today. But it says here, what did they do? What did the church do? They continued to teach and preach what? That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. And if you read on in that scripture, it's interesting because it says it, that there was great miracles, signs, and wonders that followed as they continued to preach. This verse here, you know where this fits in? It fits right in the middle of a context where they had just been told, don't talk about Jesus anymore. I think what's so cool about this church, you, you, you want to be unique and you want to be cool? These guys were unique and cool because they were told, don't preach Jesus. And you know what they did? They stood in the face and they said, you know what? I have to obey God, not man. I have to obey God, not man. You want to talk about strong? You want to talk about in your face? You want to talk about people who knew how to love and who knew how to take a message in spite of persecution? In fact, it says that they walked out of that place when they were told not to preach Christ. They walked out of that place. And it says they rejoiced. In other words, they had a party. They celebrated. They were dancing and getting excited about the fact that they were considered worthy enough to be suffered for having preached the name of Jesus. A little odd. Somebody persecutes us and makes fun of us for preaching Jesus. We don't walk out of the room jumping up and down and saying, woohoo, you know, I'm worthy. I'm, you know, it's like, it's like here they are and they're walking around excited about the fact that as they preach Jesus, they're being persecuted for it because they knew that there was one thing that made the church the church. And that was preaching Jesus Christ as the anointed one, as the one who could break people's depression break their bondage, break their hurts, break the yokes, that they truly believed that when they went around telling people they were eyewitnesses of what Jesus did, they truly believed that when they did that, it would change people's lives. And you know what? It did. It did. To the point where eventually Christianity became the religion of Rome. Can you imagine if Christianity became the religion of Canada? Where all the pagan religions were pushed aside because there was so much power that people saw in the name of Jesus. They saw so much reality and so much power and, and, and experience in Jesus. Can you imagine? The church turned the world upside down. And it was because they preached this one thing, that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ. I believe God is really in this time, compelling us as the church to push aside all the games and all the distractions and all the other things that we mess with and begin focusing on this one thing again, that Jesus is the Christ and that we as the church are called to bring Christ to other people. That doesn't mean just telling them about Jesus. It means actually showing them what it means to live a life that is embraced and engaged with Jesus, a life that is led by the Holy Spirit, a life that comes into a room, sees a need, and is able to talk and bring wisdom and comfort and healing to somebody who's lost. This is what the church is about. We have made church a little bit too much about meeting our own needs. And God does that because I believe in salvation. That word salvation means a complete wholeness, not just a salvation to eternity, but also that God supplies our needs. But we've gotten so caught up in just that one area in our Western culture because we are so comfortable with materialism. 
We're always pursuing that next thing. And here Jesus is saying there's so much deeper that will transform people's lives than just material things. This is what the church is about. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, it says, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now remember, Jesus was talking about, I will build my church on this statement, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that he's the Savior, that he's the anointed one. It says, now having built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God. Every single one of us is part of this movement. Every single one of us is part of this thing that God is doing Sometimes Jesus referred to it as the kingdom of God. In fact, if you look through all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and even Acts, you see that they talked about this one thing about Christ, and it was always in reference to the kingdom of God. And so here it says that we are being built up into this thing that represents a temple. And what does a temple do? A temple was where God dwelt. It was a, it was a place that said, this is where God is is. Do our lives say this is where God is? My lifestyle, my actions, my thoughts, my beliefs, do they represent a place where people can say that is obviously where God dwells? This is the process of our heart that God is trying to do. But notice once again, it says that it's all built on the cornerstone of Christ. It's all built on the cornerstone of Christ. If you don't know what a cornerstone is, this is a picture of an ancient cornerstone. And what they would do is when they built their big buildings out of stone, they would take a huge rock and they would make it absolutely perfect. And every single stone that was laid on that building was all lined up completely to that one rock. In other words, it was the reference point. You could tell, are things straight? Are we doing this right? We'll check back with the cornerstone. Does it all line up to the cornerstone? And every single rock would be chiseled and fitted so that it would fit in place, but it always went back to one thing and one thing alone. And that was Jesus Christ to that cornerstone. In our lives... We can read tons of books, lots of self-help. We can see, okay, well, here's an idea here and here's an idea there. And I think we've gotten so far away from referring back to Jesus Christ as our reference point that the church in some places is being built on man's ideas, man's feelings, man's emotions, rather than actually being built on this solid truth of Jesus Christ and who he is and who he was. We are called to represent Christ. This is what the church is about. Now, if you look through scripture, there are so, it, the paradox is in so many things. Now, what is a paradox? A paradox for some people has been mistaken as being a, something that's conflicting or contradictory. Well, if it's contradictory, what that means is there's a truth that doesn't line up with another truth. What a paradox is, and a paradox has been mistaken for, for a contradiction, but it's not. Paradox is a truth that will bring you to the place, but it doesn't make sense the way that it leads you there. For example, who would say that in order to become the greatest, you have to be the least? That's a paradox, right? It doesn't make sense. Or how about this when Jesus says, give and it shall be given unto you? That's a paradox. I mean, if I give away, I'll actually be added to. In fact, Proverbs says the same thing. There's one who scatters yet increases all the more. There's one who throws his bread out on the water and it comes back to him on every wave. So there's these paradox in, in, in the scripture. It doesn't make sense. And so we've been talking and been using this word gather about coming to a place, gathering together as the church. 
And in this verse here, it says in Hebrews 10, 24, it says, let us hold resolutely to the hope that we confess for he who promised is faithful. You know, I, I don't know how you read scripture or if you do or when you do, how you take and process what God says. But if you were to take a scripture like this here, that sentence in itself is enough to think about for a whole day. That sentence alone is enough to think about for a whole day. It says, let us hold resolutely to the hope that we confess. So in other words, we should be confessing our hope, which is exactly what happened in the church. That's why the church saw miracles is because the church was out confessing their hope in Jesus Christ. But it says, he who promised is what? He who promised is what? So when you're having a day and you don't feel like God's being faithful, what do you do? Go to the Word and say, no, no, he's faithful. My perspective is off. I've got to change my perspective. Because the Word of God says he's faithful. There's something that I'm not seeing here. There's something that's trying to mess me up and take me away from the hope that I'm going to hold on resolutely. Because he's the anointed one. And so it goes on and says, He who promises faithful. He goes, and let us consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Have you ever been told by somebody, hey, you, you should be doing this? And you felt like saying, you know what, just get out of my face. <laughs> like seriously, you know, it's my life. Don't tell me what to do. Quit bothering me. And here the word of God says that we should be spurring each other on to good works. Now, I'm not a horse. Nobody's ever spurred me. But I, I'm sure if you, if you talk to a horse and say, what's it like to be spurred? They would probably say, nah, or something along that line. We're supposed to spur each other on to good works. That means a good kick in the rear end with something that doesn't feel comfortable. This is what we're called to do for each other. You know, it's not comfortable. Anyways, it goes on, spur each other to good love, to love and good deeds. Let us not neglect meeting together as some have made a habit, but let us encourage one another. Getting together is a habit. It's something that you have to teach yourself to do. I'll tell you what, sometimes when I, and I know that there's a lot of you here, you feel the same way. You get home from work, you don't feel like in half an hour getting back in your car and going to, to a small group somewhere. You'd rather turn on the TV, put your feet up, and, or read a book, or whatever you do. Getting together is a habit. It's something that you have to create. So if you say, I don't feel good doing that, God says, mm, well, I love you enough to make you uncomfortable. Anyways, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. In other words, he says, let this increase. God only knows how many times I didn't feel like getting together with people, and I did. And had I not gotten together with them, I would have stayed in my situation. I would have wallowed in my self-pity. I would have stayed in a place where my situation wouldn't have changed because there wasn't somebody around me to say, hey, you know what? You can do this. You can get up and you can, you can do this. I believe in you. You have Christ in you. He's your hope of glory. That's why we come together. That's why we are the church. That's why we gather. But here's the paradox. Jesus with his disciples, or uh, yeah, Jesus with his disciples in Matthew 28, it says, Jesus came to his disciples and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we're told to come together to be encouraged, but we're also told to go. And I think the reason why the church today is dying, I think the reason why, in general, why people are leaving churches is because of the fact that we've gotten really good at coming together in a place and doing our four walls, but we've been very poor at going. We've been very poor at being the church, the gathering at large, and going into our lives 
and saying, you know what? There's people in my life that need to hear that Jesus is the anointed one. We've kept our faith to ourselves. We've had this jewel. We've had this awesome gift of God's love. And we've in some ways been too ashamed to share that with other people. Now granted, there's a way that you share a gift with people. And one of them is not taking it and shoving it down their throat. Right? I don't care how nice the gift is. You buy me a Rolex watch and you shove it in my mouth, I'm not going to appreciate it. Right? So here's the church. And Jesus is saying, you know what? Yeah, it's important that you gather and be encouraged. But it's also important that we take what we find and hear, what we hear and hear, this relationship, this goodness, this grace, And we take it to other people. And that's the paradox, that we gather in order to go out. We come here to be fed the Word of God, relationship to be encouraged for the purpose of taking what we get here and going out to where we're at. Because if we're not taking what we get here out there, then we've only got half the equation and we're only doing what half of the church is supposed to be. And we're only seeing half the results. And we're only seeing Jesus half the time. You understand where I'm going with that? We have a life that if we truly believe in what Jesus Christ has done for us, it is an amazing thing. It's not always emotionally high, but yet it is still comforting and it is empowering in a life that we can walk and have a joy in spite of the circumstances, and still be able to share this hope of Jesus with other people. It's good to know that I'm loved all the time. It's good to know that I have a Savior who's with me all the time. It's good to know that I have people who love Jesus that I can call, that I can get with any time. Because it's what church is about. And you know what's even greater is to know that in those relationships, I can be challenged to grow. Say, you know what? That needs to change. I need your help. And I know that you can do that because you have the wisdom of God and our relationship can do that. God brings us together so we can go out. You're going to start seeing this a little bit more around Jubilee. Love Jesus, live Jesus. Love Jesus, live Jesus. This is who we want to be. I believe that this is one of the most simplest forms and yeah, it's it's a perception. It's not the only way to say it. But I believe that this is what God's called us to do. If we love Jesus, what does it mean to love Jesus? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. What's the two commandments that he gave us? He said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. and To love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two commandments that Jesus left. If we can do that, if we can love Jesus by being obedient to him, How do you show someone that you love them? You hang out with them. You spend time with them. Devoted to prayer. Church was devoted to prayer. Why were they devoted to prayer? Because they loved Jesus. They remembered Jesus who gave. They they were there. They saw him die on the cross for them. That was in their mind. Can we love Jesus? And then can we live Jesus? Can we take what Jesus did and can we say, God, I need your help in understanding what it means to live like Jesus did. Help me to walk in every situation and respond the way that Jesus would. This is what church is about. Loving Jesus, living Jesus. You know what happened to the church? Was Jesus left, the Holy Spirit came, The church was empowered. They saw signs and wonders and miracles. They were persecuted, but they kept pushing against the persecution. Then eventually what happened was Christianity became the religion. And they got complacent. And all of a sudden, people of influence started coming in, and the church stopped being a movement. It started becoming a program. It became an institution. I want to see our faith. I want to see the church as a movement again. 
Because a movement is something that is alive. A movement is a bunch of people who believe in someone or something so much that they will give their life for it. And it's full of life. I'm not willing to give my life for dead religion. But I'm willing to give my life for Jesus. And I think a lot of people are at that same point. That's why we see people leaving churches is because they're looking for something full of life. But here's what they haven't been told is that life is in you. We're looking for a revival. Revival means to have life again, to see these things happen all over again. But it doesn't happen just because of coming to a program. It happens because us, the church, we get on our knees before God and we have that relationship with God. We begin to let God be God again in our lives. There's a statement that I heard, and it's very strong, it's very powerful. I'm, just, I'm gonna say it. I don't know if it's necessarily the absolute truth, but I want you to think about this. I heard one man say, if Jesus can't be your Lord, he's not your savior. If he can't be your Lord, he's not your savior. It's a pretty powerful statement. It's one that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking, is my life really surrendered to God in a way that makes him Lord? Or, <clears throat> excuse me, do I get to be David Freeman and take a little bit of the Savior whenever I need it? I have all these expectations of God, of what he can do, of who he is, his power. And yet if I really ask myself, am I completely surrendered to the fullness of who he is? It's a strong question. Because if he is going to be my Lord and master, I know that it's in that place, in the middle of the will of God, where the absolute best life possible will ever be lived. I don't know that I'm there yet. But if I can learn to love Jesus, if I can learn to live him, and to see, like Paul said, the power of his resurrection, God knows how much I hate to see people hurt. And sometimes God's saying, you know what? If you just step out, if you would just step out and reach out to them, you'd see me move on their behalf. If you just cross that chicken line and show them how much you love me by serving them. There's other people. What God has done in us, he's done for other people. What God has given me is for other people. This is something else that you're going to see in Jubilee. Who's the other person that you're taking with you? Who are the other people that you're reaching out with? We did the U plus two. We had the gather cards here a few weeks ago where we went around and we've met two people that we didn't know and we wrote down their names. There's actually more gather cards. And I, if you haven't done that, I recommend it. Find two people, write their names down, pray for them. How many of you are still in touch with the two people whose names you wrote down? See, it's a habit. It's a habit. We need to think about other people. If we get into this process of thinking about other people first, it's amazing what God can do in our own lives. This is really about taking inside and taking it out. What are we taking out to where we are? That U plus two thing, I'm going to challenge you to do the same thing in your neighborhood. All of us live in a house on a street somewhere, and there's two people that we don't know, and we haven't made the effort to reach out to them. I'm going to challenge you today to find two people in your neighborhood and say, I'm going to pursue these two people in relationship. 
even if it starts off with a, hey, how you doing? And eventually builds into, you want to go out for coffee? Hey, you want to come over, watch the football game? I don't care how you do it. Be intentional about creating a relationship with two people in your neighborhood that you don't know. Because this is what it means to be people who do life with others. That's what discipleship is. It's doing life with people and letting Christ be the center. And here's the questions I want to finish off with today. Are we moving or are we simply meeting? Are we just coming here and meeting? Or are there things moving in our life? Are there things that are changing? Do we see people's lives in our church changing? This is the focus. Are we moving or are we simply meeting? Are we making a measurable difference in our community? If I was to go knock on the doors of the people down the street and I say, hey, you know what? We're on the corner here. Have we done anything really? Have we offered you anything that will substantially change your life? And if they say no, then it's time to sit back at the drawing board and rethink what we're doing. These people around this church should know that we're a church. They should know that they, sh they can come here for prayer. They should know what we do and who we are. You know, something as simple as we park in front of their houses. Can we just think to write them a card and say, thanks for letting us park in front of your house and then throw in a $5 Starbucks card and put it in you know, put it in, in, in uh, the mailbox. This is simple church. We don't have to make it too complicated. It starts with those small things. It's that simple. My life, loving Jesus, making an impression on someone else's life, whose life gets changed, makes an impression on somebody else's life. This is how this works. We don't have to make it more complicated than that. And so as the church, I'm encouraging each and every one of us to think about outside of the church, outside of this building. How can we take Jesus, our love for him, and our life for him, to see something like this here, where there's a chain reaction, and at the end of time, we see all these people who were influenced because we simply loved God, because we loved Jesus, and because we lived Jesus, because we were committed to prayer, because committed to the word, because we were faithful to living this life to the very best that we could, the way that we see it in scripture. Because the church exists so that people can know God through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what my life is to represent. That is who David Freeman is supposed to be. In what way are people finding God through my life? In what way? This is church. Why don't we stand? Today, <clears throat> one of the things that I believe permeated the church was the opportunity for prayer for people to be prayed for and here at Jubilee we do this different ways at different times but before we go today I want to open up this time for us to do church to be church some of you might know someone beside you have them pray for you. We've got prayer teams that are going to come forward. Or maybe you don't want to come forward. We'll have a prayer team at the back as well. But if you need prayer, this is the time. This is the time to come. It doesn't matter what your need is. Sometimes we give out a specific need and we say, hey, you know what? We're going to pray specifically for this or this or this. Not this morning. Today we're just going to say, hey, you know what? If you need prayer, it's available this morning. And so I'm going to finish off with just a general prayer. And then after that, feel free, feel welcome to come forward. Go to the prayer team at the back. There's John and Eva back there. And then we've got Kunli and John here. And then we've got 
Amanda and Jesse. And you know, one of, the, one of the biggest things that keep us back from going to other people for prayer is sometimes we think the rest of the people in this room are going to look at us and judge us. And say, oh, what's their problem? What are they going for? You know, and then we think that they think that we're doing like the worst thing in the world. When truth is, we might just have an ingrown toenail and it hurts really bad. We just want prayer for it. You know, I smile and we joke, but you know what? An ingrown toenail, for some people who've had them, it's pretty painful. So, so this is a time for us just to care about each other. That's what prayer does. Prayer opens up time to care for each other, not to judge one another. And so if you need prayer this morning, I'm just going to pray first. Then you come up. You can find someone. There's John Eva at the back. Or just pray amongst yourselves. If there's someone you feel comfortable praying with beside you, feel free to do that, all right? So God, we just thank you for today. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was the anointed one, he was the Messiah. He was the promised one that has come to seek and save the lost. The one who came and delivered us from our fear, delivered us from sin, delivered us into a life that is more abundant. And God, today as we go from this place, we're reminded, God, that we gather here in order to go gather out there. We gather here to go out there and to find the people that are in need and that want a relationship with you. So God, I pray that you would lead us and guide us. And today as we come for prayer, God, I thank you that you and your anointing, your presence, your Holy Spirit is here to bring healing, to bring deliverance, to answer prayer, and to bring faith for those that are discouraged. And I thank you for that now in the name of Jesus. Amen.